my lifetime, the end of the world's colonial empires and a global outburst of democracy. Historically, most of the great democratic achievements took place in the Northern Hemisphere. But in this final episode, we're going to meet some people who have won ground for democracy against phenomenal odds in the Southern Hemisphere. And along the way, catch a glimpse of what I think is a crucial new battleground in the struggle for democracy. Garfield Todd drives through some of the most beautiful scenery in Africa, his ranch, which for five and a half years became his prison. I was allowed to look at the view, but I was not allowed to go more than 800 paces from this house, and on a 15,000 acre ranch, that's not very far. Garfield Todd is in charge of his own ranch again. He's 80 now one of the hundreds of people who have been the unsung heroes of democracy in my lifetime. His commitment to democracy never wavered, even when it cost him his job, his liberty, and nearly his life. Todd left his native New Zealand in 1934 to run a missionary school in what was then the self-governing British colony of Rhodesia which some 50 years later would become the independent democracy of Zimbabwe. In turn, Garfield Todd has been a missionary, a prime minister, a political detainee, and finally, a senator, appointed by Zimbabwe's first democratically elected government. The turning point in Todd's life came in the late 50s, when, as prime minister of the colony, he outraged white opinion by proposing to give the vote to educated blacks, those who could read and write and who had come in from the bush to work in the country's two biggest towns, Salisbury and Bulawayo. We hadn't thought of everybody at that moment getting a vote, but even the thought of all of these people coming in and sharing equally in a democratic order was so frightening to the electorate that in 1958 I was first thrown out of the prime ministership and then we went to an election and I even lost my seat in this area. The general attitude of whites was that Africans were an inferior people. They would be uh, satisfied with much less than white people would be satisfied with. But as the people were enlightened, the schools were started, and the Christian message was preached, obviously the people were going to want a whole lot more than they had in the way of political power. By the 1960s, Britain and Rhodesia were on a collision course. Britain would grant independence to the colony only if blacks got the vote, and the whites felt a cold wind blowing across their comfortable, privileged existence. Their form of racism was not as vicious as that of neighboring South Africa, but it ensured that around a quarter of a million whites, a tiny fraction of the population, not only kept effective power from some six million blacks, but reminded them constantly that they were an inferior people. In 1965, Ian Smith, the leader of the ruling Rhodesian Front Party, defied Britain and the world by declaring independence unilaterally. He said there would never be black majority rule in Rhodesia in his lifetime. And certainly at the stage of development we are in now, where this was one of the last countries in the world to come into contact with Western civilization, if we simply resorted to a counting of heads, then this would be irresponsible majority rule. It would be quite disastrous for this country when you consider that the mass of the people don't even understand what a government is or what democracy is. It's something that is quite foreign to them. Harold Wilson, the British Prime Minister, huffed and puffed, but refused to put down Smith's rebellion by force. 
Instead, he negotiated with him, endlessly and fruitlessly. One of Smith's first acts had been to put Garfield Todd in detention. His wife could travel freely, but he was confined to the ranch. But of course, I was never taken to court. The, the, the papers that were served on me said that they were suspicious, they were afraid I might do things which would be against the security of the country. So it says to make sure I didn't break the law, and they put me into detention. But of course, I had, my crime was talking, so naturally they thought it would be a good idea to silence me. It was very effective, the silencing. I wasn't, they couldn't print my name in the papers. I couldn't speak on the telephone. I couldn't have visitors except one or two with police permits. So that for five and a half years, they kept me very isolated. Ian Smith's rebellion plunged Rhodesia into a civil war that would take 30,000 lives, most of them black, and would end with the creation of the legitimate independent nation of Zimbabwe. This is supposed to be a Christian country. Two nationalist leaders, Joshua and Como, who had Garfield taught support, and the young and largely unknown Robert Mugabe, would temporarily set aside their tribal differences and send their guerrilla forces into the bush together. They would do battle with the colony's tough and dedicated soldiers, the sons and grandsons of the men and women who'd helped to create the wealth of Rhodesia. Clear the area! Good! Go! The war swept into every corner of the land. The guerrillas would attack and then pull back and seek refuge in neighboring black countries. The train link carrying supplies vital to the whites ran through Garfield Todd's ranch. It was constantly attacked by black nationalist forces. And they became regular visitors to Todd's homestead, seeking food and supplies, which Todd now deeply committed to their cause, would give them. They wanted, of course, bread if they could get it, but cigarettes. They wanted toothpaste and toothbrushes. They wanted uh, stamps and envelopes and writing paper. <laughs> These were the guerrillas. Um, one lot came in, 180 of them, from Mozambique, with just rags on their feet. And they wanted me to go into Bulawayo and buy 180 pairs of uh, leather boots. So I said this was utterly impossible. I couldn't go in and say 180 pairs for my friends, the gorillas, so many size six and so many size eight. So we had to find them money, which was a large sum. These were dangerous the times for Todd and his wife and family. His daughter, Judith, fled into exile, and her father came close to being charged with treason, for which he could have been hanged. Resentment from other whites was acute, particularly as they began to bury the young soldiers who were fighting to preserve their way of life. They saw Garfield Todd as a traitor in their midst. But as the war dragged on, it became clear to the white community that a military solution to Rhodesia's agony was nothing but a mirage. They would have to negotiate or be beaten by the sheer weight of numbers. They had tried to defy history and they had lost. The whole thing was a, a stupid criminal exercise headed by Ian Smith. And there were too many people around the world who didn't understand and who encouraged him, sent him on in a situation which was, in a smaller way, the same as we've got in South Africa, where the civilized and decent people of the world should be using all their influence and power to make it impossible for Borta to go on and make it that he's got to negotiate before they have to kill 100,000 people. They would have to kill 100,000 to be equal to us. We killed 30,000. For what? In 1980, a negotiated settlement led to the creation of the independent multiracial democracy of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. 
what Garfield Todd had been working towards some 30 years before. Todd continues his support for the men and women who fought for majority rule. He and his wife donated 3,000 acres of their land to blacks wounded in the war. Those former guerrillas now farm it as a cooperative. The eruption of joy that followed independence has been tempered by a somber awareness of the problems facing the new state. The agreement hammered out with Britain said there would be a democracy. Robert Mugabe, the first elected leader of Zimbabwe, said he was committed to it. I foresee a society uh, based on uh, equality, uh, where discriminatory legislation doesn't apply, uh, and uh, people are looked at as, um, uh, as people. By any standards, the transfer of power from a white minority to a black majority has been remarkable. Black nationalists now debate in Parliament with white politicians who once imprisoned them or even ordered their executions. There have been no reprisals. And if the butchers are not capable to compete side by side with the Gold Forage Commission, bad luck to them. But otherwise, the true stories are intended. But there's no opposition. Joshua and Como's opposition party has been merged into the government as a junior partner. The one-party state, Africa's 35th, was coming into being while we were there filming. And the 20 seats reserved in the assembly for whites were in the process of being eliminated. Robert Mugabe said they smacked of racism. A lot of people have trouble with the one-party state. I'm one of them. When the party becomes the state, what happens to the checks and balances, to those sinews of democracy we call opposition and dissent? And yet a lot of Africans become enraged at the notion that the Europeans brought them some kind of precious governmental gift which they then abandoned or destroyed. After all, they say, hundreds of years before the Europeans ever set foot on the African continent, there were sophisticated, impressive, African civilizations here that matched anything in Europe. These are the ruins of Great Zimbabwe, started in the 13th century, once the biggest city in Africa. These soaring granite towers and walls were built by people with no contact with European civilization. People who had created complex societies rich in custom and tradition. The modern states of Africa were largely invented by Europeans who ignored the acute tribal divisions among the people who lived here and who were indifferent to the methods the Africans used to cope with their tribal tensions. The people who come to colonize us didn't want to understand our situation as it was at that time and to help us to develop it. The idea of opposition doesn't really come into the thinking of the African. Uh, what are you opposed to? And uh, if you are opposed to it, can you help to resolve that uh, feeling within the group? And indeed, if you looked at uh, the past of Africa, uh, any opposition groups to the king would hive off from the kingdom to go and set up a totally different kingdom. But since uh, the uh, delimitation of our boundaries, colonial boundaries, where can those kingdoms be set up where they do not interfere with any existing kingdom? And so the only way out of it is to establish a one-party state where these problems are resolved uh, within the community rather than outside of the community. I would accept a one-party state 
if I was satisfied with the Constitution. But at the present moment, we are speaking about a one-party state and we have no idea what the Constitution will be. If the Constitution made sure that every four or five years we go to a general election and that everybody has to stand and can be knocked out by the popular vote, uh, then I would be, I would take the one-party state. Uh, obviously, it can be more efficient. Maybe these people will create a society in which democracy and the imperatives of tribalism can coexist. One thing is certain, the thousands of whites who fled, fearing they'd be massacred by vengeful blacks, were wrong. Many are now coming back to a country that was supposed to self-destruct after independence. And the irony is, if they had listened to Garfield Todd instead of locking him up, the change to majority rule might have been much less bloody and the results much different. Compared with some African horror stories, Zimbabwe has to be a democratic success despite the one-party state. And yet there are people who say that democracy based on accountable government and dissent and opposition and above all the rights of the individual will never work in any culture that's based primarily on tribal loyalties. And another thing, multi-party democracy seems to demand the kind of national spirit of optimism, self-confidence and tolerance. But the colonial era left a legacy of confusion and despair and wounded self-confidence that seemed to defeat democracy before it even gets started. Well, thousands of miles east of Zimbabwe, one of the most remarkable success stories of modern democracy is taking place here, in this lush, scented land just across the Coral Sea from Australia. Many of the people of Papua New Guinea, PNG, made contact with Europeans only in this century. And here they are attending an election rally. These are Highlanders, and the man they've come to listen to is Pius Wingti, a local boy who made good. When we were filming, he was the country's prime minister. He presided over a loose coalition of parties that form and reform in a manner not much different from the various coalitions that have governed Italy since the end of the Second World War. Thank you, Master of uh, Ceremony, Simon Cohen, member belong from the government lawyer. This is very much a family affair. Despite his youth, Wing Ti is perceived by his listeners as a tribal elder, a village headman writ large. He's not just the prime minister, he's their man in the capital. Port Moresby, attending personally to their concerns and needs. In this case, a health clinic, the first the people who live here have ever known. He's also here to pick up votes. One of the reasons that PNG's transition from colonial dependence to self-governing democracy has worked so smoothly, is that the colonial power here was Australia, itself a former colony which had no wish to stay. In 1975, the fact that it was time to leave became clear to Australia's Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam. I was convinced that PNG was now producing more people able to govern the country than we in Australia could spare to govern it for them. And the other thing was, of course, that... Uh, all the African countries became independent in the early 1960s. And the Caribbean started to become independent late in the 1960s. And it was quite anomalous that uh, PNG, which had three million people, should still be uh, a colony. And the Australians didn't leave a pile of post-colonial baggage behind them. Unlike the whites in Zimbabwe, they were in PNG as administrators, preparing the blacks for the day when they'd rule themselves. 
And unlike the colonists of Africa, they didn't seize the country's resources all for themselves. Comparing the situation in Africa, what happened there really was that uh, all the people that are categorized as uh, dictators now were all products of Sandhurst or of uh, the French army. I mean, it's, uh, all I can say is that Australia was a better imperial power than the British and the French. But not all Australians agreed that PNG was ready for self-government. Many forecast that the new state would collapse in a welter of bloodshed and tribal conflict. This was a country of primitive people, some thousand tribes speaking hundreds of different languages, among them headhunters and cannibals, people who solved disagreements by going to war. <laughs> One Australian cabinet minister declared that these people wouldn't be ready to run their own affairs for 75 years. The assumption outsiders made, uh, the predictions they made about this country will uh, first chaos, uh, will uh, bloodshed. We have proved that what they have uh, predicted are, uh, were not right. Papua New Guinea is not dominated by one tribe or one clan. We have so many different tribes in the country, so many different languages groups, and that is the strength of this country, so that one group cannot dominate in the country. Only in a country where you have one major tribe wanting to rule others, then you have problems. We never had a dictator. We had leaders, but leaders were prepared to sit down and discuss issues, and then they come to a common agreement. And when they agreed on that, the rest of the members of the clan or village accepted that. So we had democracy before the uh, Western concept of de democracy. We're building on that. Because there's so many tribes here, PNG is like a country of large families. And because there's so many native languages, they've given a special place to a language that's not really native to any country. It's the lifeblood of their democracy. This fellow talk, he talk pissing. Now, close to all my Mary stop long here, Savi talk pissing, you Savi? And what I think I just said is that this language is called pidgin. And almost everybody who lives here understands pidgin. You understand? In Port Moresby's beautiful parliament, pidgin, a mixture of Melanesian, Asian, and European tongues, is an official language of the strident but generally good-natured debates. Have a listen. Wonder what up? M in seven, M in talk talk, that money will not talk talk nothing, Tasso. Yeah. Because you talk talk nothing, Tasso, and all money comes from bank, no, 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 Minister? Five lakh on this, me plus save him, farmer must fulfill him. Order. You know, sir, me talking to you. Suppose, suppose one black farmer, suppose one black farmer, I mean, I mean, smart, I mean, no feeling five lakh on this, and no load him application. Me sorry to mass and me not. I must kiss him, money block and beg him. Tell him well, give him long. long. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, now you don't call him Pomeo. Me sir, you resign. Now you don't call him Pomeo. That's the highway of Pomeo. You blow, tell him the IPV blow the line. You will make him blow the hand devil of people. Thank you. One major problem in this South Pacific Eden is a lack of work for young people. Some of these kids will probably join gangs known as rascals, not a term of endearment. But this democracy, one of the world's youngest, is alive and well. There have been no coups, no clamors for a one-party state, no emerging tyrant. And it's working in part because the whites who used to rule here, unlike those in Zimbabwe, did not believe that the natives were unfit to create their own democracy. <laughs> 
One of the great chapters in the story of democracy in this last half of the 20th century has been the end of colonialism, the way in which great empires that were supposed to last for centuries just vanished. But in a way, I think they've been replaced by a new kind of military or strategic imperialism in which a powerful nation, democracy or otherwise, will protect its national or global security, no matter what that might mean to a smaller, less powerful nation, democracy or otherwise. Papua New Guinea is one of many nations in the South Pacific that want to see the region declared a nuclear-free zone. In doing so, they've come head to head with two powerful democracies, the United States and France. More than 30 years ago, the United States exploded the world's first deliverable hydrogen bomb over Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. It was one of hundreds of nuclear tests in the Pacific whose radiation effects continue to this day to kill and deform people living in the area. In 1966, France began exploding nuclear bombs over Mururoa Atoll, near its colony of Tahiti. France showered the Pacific of radiation from 41 atmospheric tests before it finally bowed to international outrage and began holding them underground. By last year, the French had set off 99 underground tests on the island, despite repeated protests of the inhabitants of the region including the colonized people of French Polynesia. In 1982, it was reported that, as a result of the constant battering by nuclear explosions, the island of Mururoa is actually sinking, spilling nuclear waste into the Pacific from a growing crack in the atoll. The country which has led the nations of the South Pacific in their opposition to the tests is New Zealand and it also refuses to allow any warships into its ports unless it receives an assurance that they're not carrying nuclear weapons. That's an assurance the United States, for one, refuses to give. The entire population of these two islands that make up New Zealand is about the same as that of my hometown, Toronto. A little more than three million. And yet this little nation has found the guts or the foolhardiness to say no to Europe, no to NATO no to French nuclear tests in the Pacific, and boldest of all, no to the presence of American nuclear warships in her waters. Why is that? What is it about the character or the history or the circumstances of a people that gives them the courage and the determination to go their own way and to pay the cost of that? Someone once remarked contemptuously that New Zealand is a triumph of the lower middle classes. Maybe that's true. The majority here are descendants of British settlers who came seeking a better way of life. And unlike the forced settlers of nearby Australia, they were free. No convicts walked these shores. They created a society which, at the turn of the century, was one of the most humane in the world. While Britain was still sending its working-class children into the mills and their parents into the poorhouse, New Zealand gave these children's great-grandparents the vote and was one of the first countries to give old people a pension. Practicing non-doctrinaire policies some now call market socialism, Successive New Zealand parliaments passed legislation years ahead of its time. These unlikely frock-coated radicals were creating, in the words of the British liberal Lord Asquith, a laboratory in which political and social experiments are made every day unparalleled by any other community in the world. Either deliberately or unconsciously, the people who came here created a society based on equality and the welfare of all. But in building their new Jerusalem, the whites quickly dispossessed the country's original Polynesian settlers, the Maoris, of much of their land. 
who today show off their culture in New Zealand's eerie Thermal Springs region around Rotorua, got something denied most colonized native people. They signed a treaty which would eventually make them free men and women equal to their colonizers. That included the vote, something Australian Aborigines would not get until well into this century. As New Zealand's economic and emotional ties to Britain have gradually loosened, it's become more aware of the fact that it's a Pacific nation. Under its prime minister, David Longhi, it has forged alliances with other Pacific countries which want the major powers to keep their nuclear weapons out of the region. About 16% of the world's globe is within what we regard as our area of prime strategic interest. Vast chunks of the ocean. We have an array of smaller island nations with whom we have the most intimate, friendly and traditional contacts who really are our first line of defense. We are pursuing a policy of making that area stable economically, politically, being involved with them, seeing that there is no pause within that region for insurgency or unrest. And further, no need for superpower encroachment. That has been the basis of our philosophy for the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty, the basis of all our diplomacy in the region. The worst thing that could happen to New Zealand is that our immediate theatre of interest could become destabilised by superpower intervention. New Zealand's opposition to French and American nuclear policy in the South Pacific began in the late 60s. By the 70s, it was so strong that the government even sent two frigates into the waters around the French testing area off Mururoa. Peace blockades formed every time a nuclear-powered or armed vessel sailed into New Zealand's ports. It was inevitable that there would be trouble with France and the United States. America would retaliate by expelling New Zealand from the ANZUS military alliance between the U.S., New Zealand, and Australia. And France would take reprisals that would shock the world. Nothing perhaps so united New Zealanders in their opposition to nuclear weapons in the South Pacific as an experience they shared one night when it seemed they had glimpsed the end of the world. War inspiring. I saw it. Stood outside and watched the sky run with rays of red rippling through the sky. Didn't know what it was. Thought it was Armageddon. Turned out to be a nuclear test that had caused some peculiar disturbance in the upper atmosphere. Those are things which caused the concern to mount. And so we have that tandem effect of a politically uh, inspired commitment to a policy and then a populist grassroots movement to be contrasted with some European peace movements which are politically, dialectically inspired and in fact with quite a substantial evidence of some Russian input. That is almost totally non-existent in New Zealand. Your peace activist in New Zealand is likely to be a Presbyterian business person, a woman that runs the play centre, basically good, stable people who don't look to the whole superpower, global nuclear deterrent philosophies, but they say those are destructive, they are bad, we want not a bar of them. And David Longy talks about the New Zealanders who lead the fight against nuclear weapons. He could be thinking about Sonia Davies, a political activist and peace campaigner. She's on her way to meet me at Hamilton in the North Island, the first leg of a hectic tour in which she'll spread the idea of nuclear disarmament to business groups, community organizations, schools, anyone who will listen. Mururoa, uh, where the French were testing their nuclear devices, we couldn't believe that they were coming to another country, even though they felt it was theirs, uh, to test their devices. They kept telling us that it was safe, and we said, if it's safe, why don't you do it at home? In, at home? Uh, drop it in the Seine, I mean, if that's okay, if it's as safe as all that, why are you doing it here? What has actually happened is that from the 60s, this whole push for a nuclear-free Pacific has grown and grown. Before the 1984 election, there was sufficient groundswell 
among the people for David Longley to know that this was what people wanted. There was sufficient concern in this country. Sonia Davies is about to speak to a group of high school students in the small town of Tamaranui. A third of them are Maoris, and they give her a traditional welcome. These students are part of a generation that's grown up in a world arming itself with nuclear weapons on a scale that stuns the imagination. And it's a generation that has to be told that in a democracy, people have to get involved, have to believe that they can help shape the policies of the countries they live in. Because the nuclear-free policy in this country um, comes from the people, from your parents, from your grandparents, from kids, from people right throughout this country. It's very important that you are aware of the part that you play in this. It's also very important that you don't take any notice of the people who say to you, people think New Zealand's crazy, they think we're unwise, <coughs> that we are threatening the whole Western alliance. Um, that we are really stuffing up the whole nuclear umbrella. Don't listen to that because it's not true. But a puny democracy like New Zealand messes with a nuclear power at its peril. For years, New Zealand has allowed anti-nuclear groups like Greenpeace to actively oppose French nuclear tests off Mururoa. In July 1985, the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior was preparing to sail into the test area. The French decided that Greenpeace and New Zealand had to be taught a lesson. The government of New Zealand had been bravely saying to the world that the risks of antagonizing a major power were not, after all, that great. But here in France, the glory of la patrie has oftentimes been much more important than something so ordinary as good relations with a fellow democracy. And so with the support and knowledge of the government of France, secret military agents set out for the South Pacific with the sole intention of committing an act of international terrorism against an ally. On the night of July 10th, agents of the French Secret Service, the DGSE, slipped into Auckland Harbor, where the Rainbow Warrior was berthed, and put two bombs on board. Explosions ripped holes in the ship's side and she began to sink immediately. A Greenpeace photographer was drowned trying to save his camera equipment. The following day, a stunned New Zealand contemplated the price that has to be paid for supporting ideas that at least one major power finds objectionable. Michael King, an Auckland writer, spent a year in France researching a book about the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior. His investigations, he said, revealed that key members of the French government were fully aware of the operation against Greenpeace. There is no doubt that it was uh, a state-sponsored terrorist act committed against a friendly power. It was an enormous shock to New Zealanders that this should be so. We've lived in an innocent world where I think the majority of New Zealanders have liked to think they could pursue a policy on a basis of a moral imperative and not have any consequences. And there's no doubt in my mind, and I think in the minds of most New Zealanders, that the French authorities chose to sink the Rainbow Warrior here in a New Zealand port because not only of New Zealand's non-nuclear policy, but because of 12 years of New Zealand agitation to try and stop French testing in the Pacific. It could have been done anywhere else without being an embarrassment to the New Zealand government. Every indication I had from the French public service was that the DGSE relished the thought of being able to do the job in Auckland Harbour as one in the eye for New Zealanders. France is such a 
French journalist Philippe Chatenay was in New Zealand preparing an article on Greenpeace shortly before the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior. Do you think that the government of France was deliberately trying to stick it to the New Zealanders in an open, public, dramatic way in the Rainbow Warrior affair? There certainly was an aspect of sticking it to somebody, but I think the, the primary target were the pacifist anti-nuclear groups, and particularly Greenpeace, which had been bothering France off Miraroa for a number of years. So I think that, yes, we really wanted to rub their nose in the mud, uh, and it was an added bonus that we could also rub New Zealand's nose in the mud, because uh, France has always considered that the assistance and hospitality shown by New Zealand and also Australia towards Greenpeace and other anti-nuclear groups was a very unfriendly act, let's put it that way. The New Zealand police captured only two of the French agents responsible for sinking the Rainbow Warrior, Major Alain Maffard and Captain Dominique Prieur. They got ten years for manslaughter. But in a series of behind-the-door deals, New Zealand handed them over to the French so that they could serve their sentence on the French Polynesian island of Howe. <laughs> David Longy, facing an election at a time when the economy was far from healthy, was at pains to assure the electorate that the deal struck with France had nothing to do with French economic threats. But I don't find that convincing. I suspect that France made it clear what could happen to New Zealand's vital European common market exports of food if the French agents were to spend 10 years in a New Zealand prison. For many French people, Nafar and Freyer were heroes in the service of their country. I think it would be true to say that at first David Longy was not overly concerned about possible trade sanctions and loss of exports to Europe, but he was made to be concerned about that over a period of time. And it was this factor that impelled, you might say compelled, the New Zealand government to accept some form of arbitration and thereby accept some form of compromise, which was counter to the assurances Longy had previously given the New Zealand electorate. Do you think that this is an example of something the world has to worry about for the next few decades? The difficulty of a small democracy like New Zealand maintaining its own policy in the face of the strong-arm tactics and capabilities of a larger power, whether it's a democracy or not. Yes, I believe you're right. I believe also that perhaps the primary responsibility there lies with the large democracy, that uh, we powerful countries should not think that uh, all rules are waived when it comes to our national interest, and we should perhaps take more into account the necessities of democracy in smaller countries. I think it's extremely likely that um, New Zealand has yet to face uh, the full consequences of its policy. I mean, the, the, the Rainbow Warrior one was uh, a hiccup. In a way, it was a historical accident. Um, the United States is capable, if it wanted to, of wreaking havoc with New Zealand's economic relations with other partners. When you have a large power speaking to a small nation, those in the small nation read escalate, intensify anything that's said, magnify it into an issue. And that, of course, is a terrible impediment to the conduct of a sensible relationship with a large power. Well, the way you tell it, there, there's just been no risk to New Zealand in taking this nuclear-free stance. So oh, there was a risk, because, you see, the risk was that people in the United States who buy our product could form the view that we'd fallen off somewhere between Albania and Nicaragua, and then, in patriotic fear, would not buy our product. But it's not happened. No, because we went in the, two years ago, we set out to, to actually go out to the world and persuade the world what our values were, the nature of our democracy, and we entrenched ourselves as having the same values, aspiring to the same qualities of the way in which we live, having the same legacy of concern for human rights and conventional constitutional structure, which made it impossible for them to think that we'd fallen off the end of the world. What's the lesson for other countries trying to be independent in the face of superpower pressure in Jamaica, Nicaragua? Um, you've got to remember that there is an inevitable reaction when policy is being driven by a country which has itself a commitment to democratic principle. The United States, in the end, is such a country. How could it be seen to be squashing the aspirations of people who genuinely, openly and democratically arrive at a policy? Well, how far are New Zealanders prepared to go 
to defend that policy, supposing trade sanctions and a substantial drop in the standard of living, for example? The answer to that question is, is this, that if it appeared to be pressure from some larger power in respect to New Zealand, then New Zealand would, would if you like, gang up and accept that there would be a need to adjust, perhaps even adversely affecting their lifestyle, then New Zealanders don't see themselves as being some inevitably reflexive lackey of someone else's foreign policy. Uh, if you surrender that, you surrender nationhood. What is there left for you to say? I am a New Zealand. New Zealand has gotten away with her defiance of two great powers. David Lange got re-elected, running in part on his non-nuclear policy, and Sonia Davies, campaigning on the same policy, is now a member of parliament. The two French agents who helped blow up the Rainbow Warrior are no longer confined on the tiny Pacific island of Howe. In defiance of her agreement with New Zealand, France released them and brought them both back home. The Rainbow Warrior was raised and kept afloat while France and New Zealand wrangled about the amount of compensation France would pay for blowing her up. Once the amount was agreed on, she was towed out to sea and ceremonially sunk. There's a poster put out by Greenpeace which says you can't sink a rainbow. It appears that the government of France does not agree. There's a growing number of United Nations countries which, like New Zealand, are ungrateful for the presence of their nuclear armed protectors. The small democracies will always have a special problem as long as there are superpowers. But the biggest problem for democracy is never outside, it's always inside, with people who take it too much for granted. These Canadian kids may never know another system, and when they start to think about it, if they do, they'll probably assume that democracy is going to outlive them and their children. And if we don't blow up the planet first, I think they're right. But some of them will never lift a finger to make sure. And those are the ones I think hurt democracy the most. The ones who just don't give a damn. Or who assume that they're too powerless to make any difference. Well, the evidence that that assumption is wrong can be found in places called Greece or Spain, or Portugal, or Taiwan, or in the breathtaking events unfolding in the Soviet Union. Millions of people all over the world, more every day, saying to their rulers, we want to make social and economic decisions. We want to have a voice. In other words, power. And in the end, that's what the struggle for democracy is all about.